In this video, I'm going to answer some of your most requested questions about sports videography. Hey, what's going on? My name is Peter Sorellis. I'm a videographer and editor from Toronto, Canada. I specialize in sports videography. And in this video, we are answering your questions. I put out an AMA on my Instagram story and I got a whole bunch of questions, way more than I could have possibly answered on Instagram. So I thought that I would use those questions as prompts to give you some of the information that you've been requesting about sports videography, video editing, filmmaking in general or pretty much anything else. So anyways, let's get into it. So like, this is the first one. This is the, all the first questions and you can just go this way. It doesn't matter if they're gray or white. It doesn't Don't look at them. makes no difference. And you can just go ahead and pick whichever ones you want. All right, so my girlfriend's gonna actually like ask me some of the questions or at least read them off me. So it's kind of like a surprise, I guess, kind of different from some of the past Q and A videos we've done. But uh, anyways, here we go. Yeah, okay, Marco shoots underscore said, Thoughts on FX3. Ooh, yeah, the FX3. I did one project with the FX3. It was the Under Armour project that I did, which was like, that's a whole other story. But that was like 13 full length videos, then a launch video, and then like 13 trailers. So I made a lot of content with the FX3 and I've edited that footage a lot. And like, look, it's crazy for low light. The ISO is insane. Dual native ISO is no joke. A7S3 has the same thing. Dynamic range on it is great. It gives you a great image out of camera if you shoot an S-Log3 especially and then like apply an S-Log3 Direct 709 LUT to it. Like it just looks super clean and like it's easy to grade, which is great. I love how small the package is as well. Like it, you really, it really does feel like you're working with a mirrorless camera and getting cinema camera quality. The thing punches like way above its weight class, especially for the price you pay for it. But my one big problem with the FX3 is you mount this top handle to it that has the audio inputs, right? But then you want to attach a monitor to the top of your handle. And you can't do it unless you put it at the back of the handle. And then you can't actually grab the handle to, like, to hold in your hand because there's a monitor on the back part where you make the grip. So there's like these weird workarounds to like how to fix that, but there's nothing that's like easy and efficient. So that really bothered me. And like just that ergonomic piece is annoying me. But if I can figure out a good solution to that, I'm pretty sold on getting an FX3. Oh, and the files, working with the files on your computer is a nightmare. You need a beast of a computer. If they put MXF files and fix the top handle situation on the FX3, it'd be a no brainer, even at like a thousand dollars more. But like overall, yeah, the camera looks beautiful. It's great for like solo content creators or people on the run. As a video person, I'd rather have the FX3 than the A7S3 just for ergonomics. And yeah, like if you're thinking about it and you can deal with the problems that it's told and you have a good computer, like go nuts. Okay, mapai.q underscore said, what was your backup plan if sports videography didn't do as well? Hmm. Yeah, so sports videography didn't do good. I was gonna work in a bank which kind of would have sucked. My backup plan was to work in a bank. Uh, I do have a business degree. I was like already in business school when I started doing videography. And then I only had like one year left by the time I was like really getting into it. So I figured I would just wrap it all up. I did not use the business degree for anything. Um, but yeah, videography like didn't really go well and I wasn't able to make money off of it. I'd probably be working in like retail banking or something right now, which like is not, that really seems like a bad place to be in compared to where I am now. Yeah, I'm happy I'm doing what I do. Any advice for someone on a small staff trying to get decent shots on an iPhone 12 Pro Max, LOL. That was asked by the 1MC. Hmm, getting good shots on an iPhone. Well, look, especially all the new iPhones, like the 12 Pro Max or something, like the video that comes out of that stuff is already like really good, especially if the lighting is good. But look, iPhones in low light are terrible. There's like, even the new ones, there's no question about it. Like, it, like you can't use them. It's like the GoPros, they've been historically bad in low light. But if you like actually properly light a subject, like with something like what I have now, where I have a key light here and a fill light, well, I kind of have a one-to-one -one contrast ratio actually, so they're kind of both keys, but whatever. You have like a key and a fill, and then your hair light back there, and like it's sufficiently bright. If you can properly expose an iPhone, like that footage is gonna look good especially the wide angle footage on iPhones. It looks like really nice now. Maybe the telephoto stuff leaves a little bit to be desired sometimes, but if you want to do like a talking head like this on an iPhone and you light it properly and you can kind of bring it into Premiere and 
fix up the hue and saturation a little bit because I do find that iPhone has a very distinct look and you can tell when something is shot on iPhone if you don't adjust the colors. Like you can make it look really nice. I think more than anything else, like most cameras, like the look of the footage really is and how you light it. Tips for if you didn't get enough footage by Daniel Moyes Media. Hmm. Tips if you didn't get enough footage. There's not much I can, like if you didn't get enough footage for a certain job, like there's not much I can tell you like for that project. Like I can give you tips going forward, but like, a lot of the time when you're doing event-based work and sports stuff, especially, like you can't make them replay the game so you can get another shot. You know what I mean? Like you're kind of just stuck with what you got. And some, I don't know what else do I say. They can't redo it. I'll get to I'll get to a helpful part, but like you kind of have to work with what you got. You know what I mean? And if it means like relying on slow motion more often, which is like you don't want to have to rely on slow motion, but if you just need to like drag clips out using slow motion and make it more of like a dreamy cinematic type of feeling and it just to like make it longer to hit your time quota, like, you know, it is what it is. But like in general, like if you're shooting and you're worried about not getting enough footage, like I would say in pregame before like stuff even tips off, focus on like getting a lot of shots of the arena, get shots of players warming up, fans coming into the stadium, pick off a lot of close-ups of fans cheering in slow motion. Stuff that's like happening around the game, but isn't actually the players playing the full game themselves. I'd focus on getting a lot of that stuff because if you don't get enough shots of players playing and doing cool things that you need for your edit, whatever video you may be making, then you can use all of that like atmosphere footage to kind of like fill in the gaps and still give people a sense of like what it would be like to be at that game without having to like worry about if the players in front of your camera did enough cool stuff for you to make your edit today. Do you shoot auto ISO question mark? Hard to adjust when lighting changes. Good question. I don't shoot auto ISO. I just set an ISO that's usually, well, look, how high you overexpose first off is kind of dead predetermined by like the, uh, profile that you're shooting in. So I'll shoot a lot of my stuff in HLG3 because I'm on the A7 III and that has 8-bit color. So I don't want to shoot in log and risk like breaking my footage as I push the colors. But anyways, I shoot in HLG3. So I overexposed by about a full stop and I'll just like set my ISO to like whatever like the lighting is in, my are in the arena or wherever I'm at. I'll find like kind of like a middle point if there's darker areas and lighter areas and I'll set my ISO like one stop brighter than that. And if I point at an area and it's a little bit darker, I'm, I'll like just leave it. And if I point my camera at an area and it's a little bit brighter, I'll just leave it. Obviously, if I'm like way underexposed or way overexposed, I'll make adjustments on the fly. But I find like auto ISO and like most auto settings can be really weird because like if the camera's just hanging around my neck and pointing down at the ground, but like it's on, auto ISO is automatically gonna like crank my ISO super high because I'm literally pointing it at the dark ground. And if I pick my camera up to frame up a shot, it's gonna be super overexposed and I'll need to wait for the camera to like make that adjustment and bring the ISO down. And I don't really wanna lose that time, especially when you're like shooting event-based work and you have to go really quickly and things happen really sporadically. You always gotta be reactionary. And that can be really tough. So I find that like just having your ISO somewhere in the middle and adjusting is the best way to go. And for me, I actually have the scroll wheel on the back of my camera, like just rotating the scroll wheel as my ISO setting. So I can very quickly change my ISO by just throwing my thumb on the scroll wheel and rotating it clockwise to lift the ISO or counterclockwise to bring it down. And that lets me adjust pretty quickly on the fly. Okay, Made by Dylan says, what are some things I can do to stay consistent with posting on YouTube? Staying consistent with posting on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's a good one because I struggled with it too. But I'd say like the one thing that has been the best for me and something that I'm doing right now, I just changed my shirt in between actually, is batch filming. So like, sitting down and filming two to four videos in one session like that's been huge for me because it's so daunting to have to like come up with a new idea and sit down and do a whole lighting setup and film it and bring it onto your computer and edit it every single week like you're not going to make it every week so if you can just come up with video ideas as you go every time you think of something like write it down in a notes pad and then when you need to film just like sit down do a lighting setup talk to the camera and film like whatever videos you wrote down and planned Maybe you're gonna film like four at once and then you can edit them all together, post one a week and now you have content for a month and you can maybe create that content in like three to four days. So if you miss a week or things get really busy, you don't need to worry about like actually missing a week in your upload schedule. 
Like obviously this doesn't work perfectly and sometimes you'll want to do videos that take more time and sometimes you want to do videos that take less time, but I've been able to find a lot of consistency by doing that. Maxim underscore Leal says, what motivates you? What motivates me? That's such a tough question. I actually, when people, when I saw the one on Instagram, I looked at it and I was like, I really have to think about that. Like that's a little bit deep. And then I just pushed it off and didn't talk about it. Uh, what motivates me though? Uh, just like, I just want to see improvement all the time. Like I just want every video to be better than the last one. I want to be able to look at my work as like a body of work over a number of years and see that improvement as I go. Like I don't want to ever look back at my work from last month or last year and be like, damn, I kind of fell off or like this isn't as good as it was. Like that would, that would like, that would hurt me. That actually would hurt me. So I just, I always want to be improving. Like I love this and I take a lot of pride in what I do. This is my passion in life. And I, I want, I, when something's your passion, like you don't take that lightly, you know what I mean? So just like making myself better. And then as far as like what motivates me for this, like, like I want to be at least on YouTube and like publicly facing and like the person who I would have liked to have as a mentor back when I was starting in like 2017 or whatever it is and I didn't know what I was doing. I just think about all the things I didn't know and how fast this learning process could have been expedited if I had someone who was just like willing to help a little bit. So I want to be that person for as many people in this little creative niche as I possibly can. And like that's what motivates me to do like YouTube and answering everyone's DMs and like doing this type of stuff that I'm doing now. So yeah, I hope that's a good enough answer. Brian Hood underscore asks, ever play with Blender? Blender's a fun program. I think it's awesome. There's like a there's like open source 3D program out there. I had a little bit of time at the start of the pandemic and I made like this donut animation with the help of blend, lots of help from Blender Guru on YouTube, like an amazing YouTube channel. Basically it's just like, teaches you how to use Blender by having you make a donut, which is kind of crazy. So like I made this donut on Blender and then I used like some animation skills that I already had from After Effects and like made it fly around the screen and stuff. So it was kind of fun, but I just didn't have time after that. I ended up getting a full-time job and like work picked up and now I'm just busy all the time. So I didn't get to do much more of Blender. I did do a little bit of stuff with Cinema 4D, but if I ever have the time, I would absolutely love to like deep dive into 3D and like really get a good grasp of it. Nate VSL asks, best beginner camera for videos and pics? All right, best beginner camera for videos and photos. And I'm gonna answer this with like a sports videography. What's like best beginner camera for photos and videos for sports, since you know, that's kind of like what I do. But in my opinion, it's like not even close. Like the A6300, A6400, A6500 series from Sony, that's like the best place to start if you're getting into sports videography or even photography, look, there's other options for photography as well. But like for video, those three cameras, especially for a crop center camera, look so good. You can get them used now for like less than a thousand bucks. Even maybe new, you can get them for less than a thousand bucks considering how old they are, which is like awesome. You can film. 4K up to 30 frames per second, which is like unheard of for a sub $1,000 camera and it looks pretty good. You can get 120 frames per second in 1080p and it can produce a really nice looking image, especially if you can like nail that exposure. I actually have an A6500 still as my backup camera because like I legitimately do think it holds up and I actually do use it for events. I filmed the Grey Cup with my A6500 as my B cam. I filmed the CEBL finals with my A6500 as my B cam. Like those three cameras are awesome. They're affordable. And if you upgrade your lenses as you go, you can really make them look good. So I'd recommend any beginner to like get that camera and grow with it for a number of years before looking to move on to something else. Ben S. Coles asks, favorite shotgun mic? You know, I actually don't use shotgun mics that much. Like I'm using a lav right now and I pretty much always film my YouTube videos. A shotgun mic is a mic like you mount to the top of your camera. A, lav a lavalier mic is like a mic that you like. The fuzzy ones? Yeah, the fuzzy ones. Okay. Yeah. Like I'll get audio from a game when I'm filming on a shotgun mic, 
but like it's really just scratch and then I do a lot of sound design to it and I keep the uh, audio record level of my camera pretty low so nothing peaks. And then when I'm filming talking heads like this, I'll usually lab someone. Like a run and gun dirty shotgun mic for cheap. I like the Rode Video Micro because it's just super small and sounds good enough, especially if you're like within three feet, that microphone sounds pretty good. Um, I know that some guys who I'm friends with use the Rode NTG3, I believe it is. If I got that model number wrong, I'm flashing the right model number on the screen right now. But they use that shotgun mic and like I've personally heard it for like talking at interview stuff and like it sounds crisp. It's a bit expensive. I think that microphone's like a thousand dollars or something. But as far as like high quality shotgun mics, that thing is awesome. And then like the Rode Video Micro for like under a hundred bucks if you want a budget option is pretty sweet as well. Starks shot it, asked, who slash what was your first big name opportunity? All right, so I guess my first big name opportunity was with Under Armour back in like, I think it was 20, summer of 2018 maybe, summer, summer of 2019 I think it was. I filmed a camp for Under Armour. It was through the youth basketball league that I was working with at the time. Um, I don't really show any of the work from it because like it's so old, it's just like not to the quality of work that I do now. But like that was kind of like the event where I got to brush shoulders with some of the uh, Under Armour representatives who brought me on to do the recent project they did for Under Armour. So that was kind of like my first exposure into like big names and you know, like it got me a little project with, that I kind of did like with Under Armour around and then I actually did a project for Under Armour as a result of that. So I guess that would be it. If we're not gonna count that, then getting my full-time job at the CEBL is probably the first like quote unquote big name because it is a professional league after all. Probably Under Armour, but if you don't count that, then I guess the CEBL. Bit of a confusing answer. A Chan period underscore asks, why is shooting and editing videos so hard? <laughs> Sad face. <laughs> All right, I think this is gonna be the last question because I can feel the sillies creeping in. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't think it's like, like look, everything's gonna be hard when you first start, right? Like if you don't do something that much, you're gonna try it, it's gonna be really difficult and you're not gonna do so well the first time. My first videos looked like crap. I did a video on this channel showing my first video and it's very cringeworthy. Um, it's really just about like holding a camera in your hand and filming and not necessarily just filming sports, but filming like anything, like product videos, lifestyle stuff, like just going out with your friends and shooting portraits or whatever. Like just filming and using your camera as much as you possibly can to really master it. And then just spending like hours and hours and days and weeks in front of your desk editing that footage and learning as you go through the entire process. And then like finishing a project, doing it all again, learning as you go through the process and just doing that for years. That's really the only way to get good. Like you can study in school all you want, you can learn as much theory as you want, but if you don't like practically apply it, you're never gonna get good. I think that's gonna be it for this video. I feel like we've covered a lot of questions. If you have any more questions that you wanna answer, drop them down in the comments section. And if you like this video, please make sure to subscribe to my channel because I post videography and video editing tips and tutorial videos similar to this one. And I throw some Q and A's every once in a while on a regular basis. And I would love to have you around for that. Anyways, it's gonna be all for this week. So until next time, peace. All right. <laughs>